Saat Farkı'ndan merhabalar. Her hafta farklı ülkelerden konuklarla farklı seslere ve farklı perspektiflere yer vermeye çalışıyoruz. Bu hafta yine ekonomi konuşacağız. Türkiye ekonomisine biraz dışarıdan bakacağız. Geçtiğimiz günlerde dikkat çeken bir yazı kaleme alan Çinli bir finans uzmanı bugün konuğum. Türkiye'nin çok tartışılan ve genellikle yerli ve yabancı ekonomistler tarafından eleştirilen düşük faiz politikasına dair farklı bir perspektif sunduğu için bu hafta özellikle buna yer vermek istedik. South China Morning Post gazetesinde yayınlanan yazısının başlığı, kurda yaşanan sıkıntılara rağmen Türkiye faizleri düşürmekte haklı olabilir şeklindeydi. Ne diyor yazıda özetle? Türkiye üretimi ve büyümeyi döviz kuruna tercih etti. Bence bu mantıklı bir seçim. 97-98'de Güney Kore yüksek faize dayanan IMF programını uyguladı. Herkes şimdi bu programı eleştiriyor çünkü büyümeyi düşürdü. Uzun vadede enflasyonu düşürmenin tek yolu yerli üretimi artırmaktır. Kim diyor? 80'lerde Çin Merkez Bankası'nda görev yapmış. Şu anda Yatırım Bankası FBI China Capital'ın CEO'su olan, aynı zamanda Çin ekonomisi üzerine de bestseller olmuş İngilizce iki kitabı e, bulunan Joe Zeng bizlerle. Welcome Mr. Zeng. Thank you very much for participating, uh, for taking time for us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Zeng, uh, your recent article on Turkey's highly debated uh, low interest rate policy offers an interesting perspective. Uh, while many economists inside and outside of Turkey criticize this policy, uh, you suggest that uh, Despite currency woes, uh, Turkey may be right to cut interest rates. Uh, you say uh, Turkey's decision to protect domestic production over its exchange rates may be its most sensible choice. Uh, why do you think so? Could you please uh, elaborate for us? Okay. Um, at the moment, Turkish uh, inflation rate is very high, 36%. Now, given the high inflation you have to ask the question, why? Of course, there are many reasons. There is imported inflation as well because of uh, uh, Turkish Lira's uh, depreciation against the uh, major currencies. Now, at the end of the day, inflation is an indication that demand for products is more than the supply of products. So whatever the reason of the inflation, at the end of the day, it's demand versus uh, supply. Demand is more than the supply. So what you should do is to boost the supply and don't kill demand. Don't kill production. What the uh, Turkish government has done is correct, is absolutely smart. By reducing interest rates, you give the struggling Turkish business more breathing space. Give them a relief. At the moment, Turkish companies are already suffering. They suffer from several fronts. They suffer from consumers' reduced purchasing power. They suffer from high interest rates. They suffer from supply chain problems. And of course, they suffer uncertainty. Now, given the uncertainty, what the government should do, and this is government's duty, to give them a relief and lower interest rates is much needed. Uh, but Mr. Zhang, almost all central banks uh, in the world uh, do the opposite. They uh, either raise the interest rates or they keep them steady. Uh, so in your article also, uh, in line with the Turkish government, uh, you prioritize uh, production over inflation. Uh, you suggest that expanding domestic uh, production is the ultimate way uh, to bring down uh, the inf inflation. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, persistent inflation might also harm uh, production and investment in the medium to long term. So don't you think the other side of the debate uh, has a po point as well? Uh, what I mean uh, by the other side of the debate is uh, many economists, uh, to be honest, uh, in the world. So what is your explanation or what is your take on that? Okay, they do have a point. They do have a point. The problem is there are so many things to do. The Turkish government should do many things. But then in this uncertainty, you have to say what is the most important policy goal? In my view, the most 
important policy goal is to stimulate domestic production and create jobs and nurture the, the struggling Turkish business. They need a relief. They, they are suffering from all fronts. And of course, at the same time, um, job creation and the job uh, retention is critical. If you raise interest rates, when you, you keep interest rates high, a lot of companies will go under. A lot of more companies will go under. And we have seen that in Southeast Asia, uh, in uh, Indonesia, in Thailand, and uh, in Korea. In 1997, 98, millions of people were made redundant, and uh, hundreds of thousands of companies uh, went bankrupt. We have seen that in China, too. Um, in the 1980s, I was an uh, officer at the People's Bank of China, the Central mm -hmm. Bank. I have participated in many discussions and uh, policy drafting sessions in Beijing. Uh, I have observed my bosses, my uh, senior colleagues. They struggled with and they juggled many policy uh, goals. At the end of the day, they made a right choice. The right choice is despite so-called negative interest rates, despite the negative interest rate margins, they kept lending rates low at between six to eight percent. And even when inflation rate was double digit, even when the, after the interest rate subsidy on bank depositors, the, uh, the banking cost, the cost to the banks, the funding cost of the banks, was more than 10% in some months. Uh, the capital lending rates at uh, six to eight percent. So that give struggling businesses confidence and certainty. And uh, very quickly, of course, the production skyrocketed uh, 20, 30 percent a year. Uh, and eventually, China walked out of uh, high inflation. And inflation, once you have inflation, it's not easy to eradicate. And, uh, you know, we have seen that in Tur Turkey in the past 20 years. Turkey's inflation rate has been relatively high. To me, from an uh, outside, I see that as an indication that the domestic production has been relatively weak and not robust enough to offset expansionary monetary policy. And that has to be taken care of. Lower interest rates are the way to go. I see. So you think Turkey Central Bank will continue lowering the interest rates and inflation uh, will uh, eventually, what do you mean uh, eventually? By the way, what do you mean eventually? How long it will take? What's your estimation? I think within a year or two, uh, inflation rate in Turkey will be brought under control. There is a base effect as well. Inflation rate in the past uh, 12 months uh, was very high. But a year from now, um, you would expect, uh, the, because of the base effect, inflation should come down. And if uh, uh, the Turkish government uh, stay the course, stimulate domestic production and the export would increase as well, um, and if, uh, imports will be discouraged and the production will be enhanced. So in a year or two, inflation will be brought under control. I see. Uh, so, Mr. Zhang, I also want to talk about this uh, China comparison uh, because, you know, uh, Mr. President Erdogan also uh, gave uh, China as an exam example while defending his policy. Uh, so, he said, uh, we have started uh, a new era to break the grip of uh, interest rates and achieve economic growth based on production. We will lure foreign investors. This is how the Chinese economy has grown with its young population, industry, and uh, production. Uh, Turkey has more advantages compared with China. We are closer to the market, uh, he said. So do you think uh, Turkey can or uh, should copy the Chinese model? Uh, do you see that as feasible, given that uh, both countries have very different political systems and uh, economic structures, obviously? If I were the governor of uh, Turkey's uh, central bank, I would cut interest rates to below 10%. So that's number one. And number two, in terms of uh, 
comparison between Turkey and China, of course, uh, the Turkish economy is much more sophisticated, and more advanced in terms of uh, uh, market orientation and sophistication and the participants in the economy. The um, Chinese economy is uh, a little different because, uh, you know, about half of the year, or up to 40% of the Chinese economy is still driven by the state sector, uh, up to 40%. And of course, uh, Turkey is a very market-driven economy. And uh, I think the president was right when he said uh, Turkey had a lot of advantages, and I agree. Uh, of course, you have the advantage of uh, a market-driven economy. Uh, geographically, you have the uh, proximity to the European market, uh, and uh, and uh, the participants in the Turkish economy are more sophisticated. And without uh, without a doubt, that, that these are all true. Uh, the the Chinese uh, system uh, worked well in the past uh, 40 years, uh, year on year growth. Uh, for 40, year after year growth for 43 years, and that is uh, quite a remarkable achievement. Um, what uh, China can offer is um, that episode, how to bring inflation down. If you really want to bring inflation down, you have to stimulate production. And exchange rate is important, but secondary. I see. So, by the way, speaking of this uh, Chinese model, uh, we mainly associate China with cheap labor and uh, production, but uh, surely it's beyond that. Uh, so, can you tell us more about uh, what this Chinese model is? Uh, is it the same okay. model as it was uh, before, for example? And also, a follow-up question, uh, what changes do you expect uh, as a result of uh, President Jinping's common prosperity push? Is this a new dimension to the China model? Right. Um, in terms of uh, common prosperity, um, what the government means is that there is a tremendous inequality and there is a lot of corruption in the bureaucracy uh, and, uh, of course, uh, and everybody benefited from China's prosperity in the past 43 years. Uh, but uh, people in the countryside, I'm from the countryside in central China, uh, my uh, brother and my sisters are still making, uh, you know, less than 200 US dollars, less than 300 US dollars a month, uh, compared to uh, really uh, advanced countries' uh, salary in Beijing, Shanghai. So the gap between rich and the poor is wide, is wide, and uh, has probably widened in the past 43 years. And the government is very aware of that. And the government wants to uh, build more roads, railways, bridges, and tunnels to um, allow prosperity to trickle down to the countryside. And I uh, fully endorse that uh, uh, policy. And of course, from a policy point of view, the Chinese government has cut, abolished agricultural tax. So that's very positive. Um, the government is also facilitating urbanization allowing more people or enabling more people to move from the countryside to cities, to factories. So that's the Chinese model. Of course, the Chinese model also means there is no independence for the central bank. Uh, we in China, we don't pretend um, the central bank has any independence. The central bank in China, where I used to work, uh, is just another ministry, similar to the Ministry of Finance. That has uh, advantages as well as disadvantages, yeah. but that's the way uh, China has chosen. Uh, it, seems, it seems to have worked reasonably well, given um, how poor China was. And uh, in terms of uh, um, common prosperity, uh, I think the government is uh, uh, very determined. And uh, given the... Um, the central command nature of the economy, um, I'm uh, optimistic. Uh, common prosperity will be achieved in the next decade or two. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Mr. Zhang, also I want to uh, talk about uh, Chinese economy a little bit uh, more. Uh, we have been talking about China's rise, uh, you know, uh, for the past few years. And China is expected to overtake the U.S. as the world's largest economy within the next uh, 10 years. Uh, however, some analysis say uh, issues of governance, uh, rising debt, uh, the pandemic, of course, and uh, property market turmoil might delay this. Uh, so what is your take? Uh, what are the challenges for, uh, for the Chinese economy, in your view? Um, there are two major challenges for the Chinese economy at the present. One is a credit crisis is raging through the country. After 43 years of uh, rapid credit growth, credit expansion, money supply growth, um, today China's uh, uh, money supply is 300% of GDP, and that's, that's a world record. Uh, China is smaller, much smaller than the U.S. in terms of uh, uh, economy's uh, size, but China's uh, uh, money supply is bigger than the U.S. and the European Union together. As, as you can see, we have a, a credit crisis uh, on hand. There is a lot of default um, and a lot of uh, subprime crisis uh, going on at the moment. The property sector is overbuilt and the property developers are uh, overly indebted. And of course, uh, a lot of companies are going bankrupt at the moment. So we are dealing with this uh, credit crisis. So that's a major problem. On the other hand, um, China's uh, uh, mercantilist uh, approach to economic growth in the past 40, 50 years um, has gone a very long way. And there is a lot of resistance from the European Union and uh, America to China's uh, business approach. And, uh, you know, I expect uh, the, the two sides to work their way out. Uh, I'm optimistic, but there are short-term challenges, mainly two fronts. At the domestic level, and um, the uh, the headwind on the export front. I see, and also uh, I would like to mention this uh, competition, or uh, let's uh, say uh, trade wars between uh, China and the U.S. You know, uh, trade wars uh, have been dominating world economy in recent years. Uh, we have been covering that a lot, especially it was very uh, tense uh, during uh, Trump. Uh, now uh, we are still uh, not very sure uh, about Biden's approach. Uh, to this matter, but uh, he doesn't also seem very different uh, from Trump. Uh, I also wonder your opinion, by the way. So what do you expect in a uh, global geopolitical game, and uh, what impact this uh, trade wars uh, might have on global economy in general, and Chinese economy in particular? This uh, so-called trade war has been going on for five years. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Chinese economy has uh, survived reasonably well. Uh, of course, it's slowing down, uh, but it has survived. Uh, it shows the resilience of the Chinese uh, economy and a very diversified economy too, I should add. Um, you know, given the, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, both countries need each other and the two economies are very intertwined, uh, I think uh, the two governments will work uh, uh, some uh, compromise uh, in the next uh, year or two. Um, at the moment, I think both, part, both countries have shown willingness to, to talk and negotiate. Um, so I'm optimistic on that front. So you are optimistic and you believe that the issue will uh, not be as tense as uh, during uh, President Trump's era? Uh, both countries uh, understand each other's position very well. Uh, they have articulated uh, on numerous occasions on many pl platforms, uh, you know, I think uh, both, part, both countries need uh, some compromise, and uh, a compromise will be worked out. But do you really think this, uh, I mean, the uh, trade wars uh, have uh, impacted Chinese economy in a very bad way, or it didn't uh, really uh, impact at all? Uh, maybe, had, maybe the Western media is exaggerating the issue, maybe. Uh, what do you think? Um, the uh, trade war over the past five years has clearly slowed the Chinese export mm -hmm. growth. I see. Um, added 
Chinese exporters' production costs and um, compromise their profit margins. Yes, th there is clearly an impact. Um, a lot of companies have uh, uh, exited China, migrated to uh, countries like uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and that will continue. The uh, Chinese cost of production is growing as well. Uh, in terms of labor costs, uh, my, uh, many of my uh, relatives and siblings, they are in coastal cities in China, uh, in factories. Um, and of course, their wages have grown um, several hundred percent in the past uh, 20 years. And so that has compromised the Chinese uh, exporters' competitiveness. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, uh, strengthening renminbi. The Chinese currency, after depreciating for the first 30 years, uh, in, the, in the past 10 years, um, has uh, uh, regained a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate it considerably. I see. So what's your... Exp I, uh, uh, sorry. The Turkish lira to gain, I expect Turkish lira to regain lost ground in the next uh, few years too. I see. Uh, so, uh, what's your expectation uh, for the Chinese economy to be the largest, uh, to be the number one economy in the world? Uh, do you think it will uh, overtake the U.S. in next 10 years or uh, earlier, later? What is your estimation, Mr. Zhang? Um, China has a population four to five times as big as the U.S. So, even when China becomes the number one economy, in terms of the size of the economy, China will remain a poor country, um, middle-income country. Uh, and, uh, you know, U.S. economy has uh, considerable uh, supremacy. And there is no question about that. And the U.S. is um, both very powerful and very advanced and sophisticated. And China needs the U.S. Uh, market. And uh, the U.S. consumers need Chinese uh, um, supply chains and the production. I see. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the time is up, uh, Mr. Zeng. But uh, I want to ask you, uh, are you planning to write another article on Turkey, on Turkish economy these days? Yes. I uh, received a lot of feedback from people like you and from uh, others. Uh, after the publication of my article in South China Morning Post, I wanted to write one for a uh, Turkish newspaper or a, a global newspaper uh, on, that, on these uh, issues. And I think Turkey uh, provides a very interesting um, uh, case study. I see. So I will look forward to reading your next article then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zeng. It was a very interesting uh, perspective. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Evet, saat farkında bu hafta e, ekonomi konuştuk, e, Türkiye ekonomisine dışarıdan bir gözle baktık. Ve bu hafta e, Çinli bir analist, e, finansçı, finans uzmanı, daha önce Çin e, Merkez Bankası'nda da çalışmış bir isim. E, Joe Zeng ile konuştuk, e, son yazısı üzerine e, Türkiye'nin faizleri düşürmekte haklı olduğunu iddia ettiği. Son yazısını konuştuk, böyle biraz farklı bir e, perspektif almış olduk. Önümüzdeki hafta yine farklı bir konuyla, farklı bir konukla görüşmek dileğiyle. Hoşçakalın.